Okay, so welcome again. So, so we have just three lectures before our second midterm. And yesterday somebody asked about the topics that are included in the exam. Uh, I wish we had the chance to include rate of climb before the exam, but we won't. In three hours I won't be able to cover the rate of climb. Maybe I could if I tried, but I don't want to, you know, to talk about something and then in next day in the exam ask questions about that topic. So because of that I will not be asking questions related to rate of climb. Uh, so let's start with what we were uh, talking about on Tuesday. So let me go back to the 15th of April. Okay, so previously we had talked about the trust required for an aircraft during a steady level flight. And trust required is nothing but the aerodynamic drag force for that flight condition. And this drag force changes with the speed of the aircraft. And the relation can be seen in these equations. Okay, so we just use the drag equation. And then uh, for the drag, in the drag equation, we have the drag coefficient. But drag coefficient is a function of lift coefficient. And for the lift coefficient, we use weight is equal to lift equation. And then uh, the weight of the aircraft is included in this uh, equation. So by the way, this is the equation for power. Um, so anyway, at every speed, the aircraft requires a different thrust value. And there's a different power value associated with that. And if you plot this for different speed values, these are the curves you typically get. So for thrust required, you get such a curve. And power curve is related. Uh, the only difference between the thrust curve and the power curve is to obtain the power curve, you multiply the thrust curve with the speed of the aircraft. Um, and then we talked about the available thrust and available power. We talked about uh, how thrust force is created in an air breathing engine. And we talked about the efficiencies. Uh, and then I said, in this course, we will be talking about either a propeller used to create the thrust force, or uh, we'll be talking about the jet engine where the thrust force is directly created by uh, the jet ejected out of the engine. And there's a very important difference between two different types of uh, propulsion system. And the difference is follows. Uh, if you are using a propeller to create the thrust force, then uh, it is assumed that the power remains constant throughout the entire speed range. Okay, so you set the uh, in the cockpit, you set the throttle setting to a certain value, and no matter what the speed of your aircraft is, the power output doesn't change. Uh, in this case, thrust changes because there's this relation. Remember, you should uh, always remember this relation between thrust and power. Okay, so if power doesn't change with speed, then thrust changes with speed due to this relation. And the, uh, the thrust uh, has such a variation in this case. For small V values, you have a large thrust, but as V is increased, the uh, thrust drops down, as you see here. So this is the case with a propeller. Uh, and if you are using a jet engine, then this time the thrust of the engine is assumed to be constant. Okay? Um, so I didn't explain why thrust doesn't change with speed for a jet engine or the power doesn't change with a propeller engine. Uh, but these are fairly uh, accurate assumptions. Okay? So if you search internet for real power and thrust measurements for real engines, then you will see that for jet engine thrust value more or less stays constant in a very large speed range. Uh, in this case, thrust doesn't change, but again, from this relation, if thrust is not a function of V, then power changes linearly with V, and in this case, the power curve becomes a line like this. Okay? Now, uh, before I proceed, Further, I would like to show you an example. So I think this example will be very helpful for you to understand how um, uh, 
what do you do with this information? Okay, so we've been talking about thrust required and power required curves, and then we talked about how propeller and jet engines can create thrust and power. So how we can combine all this information to calculate uh, aircraft performance? So today I would like to talk about that. Well, first of all, uh, whether you have a propeller engine or a jet engine, you always have such a device in cockpit where the pilot can uh, adjust the, the output of the engine. Okay? So this is the Boeing 747 aircraft. It has four engines, and as you see, there are four uh, throttle levers here, and they are all connected, uh, because usually during uh, regular flight, you set the output of each of the engines to be equal to each other. In extreme cases, uh, you may have to set different thrust values for different engines if there's a malfunction, for example. But most of the time, you uh, change the output of the engines together. Uh, so when the pilot changes that, what that does is, so let me use a different color. So as the pilot changes the position of uh, those throttle levers, uh, the engine thrust changes, okay? So Boeing 747 aircraft uses turbofan engines, and for turbofan engines we assume approximate as a jet engine, as a purely jet engine, and uh, it adjusts the, the thrust output. So let's say this is the thrust required curve for that aircraft. And when the, uh, the throttle is set to idle, uh, so, so let me draw a, a side view. So this is, uh, when you look at that throttle uh, mechanism from the side, this is what you see, right? So this is the throttle set at idle. Thrust is almost equal to zero. So, at this, at this case, the thrust available will be here. So, the red one is thrust available equal to zero. Uh, so, for takeoff, the pilot sets the throttle to maximum, right? So, let me use a different color. So, let me pick this green color. So, this is 100% throttle setting. And at that point, the engine will be producing the maximum thrust uh, they can produce. And let's say the maximum thrust value is somewhere around here. So this is TA max. Uh, so if the aircraft, let's say the aircraft takes off and reaches a certain cruising altitude, and at that altitude, if the throttle is set at maximum value, then the aircraft will reach a steady level flight condition, and that steady level flight condition will be taking place at this particular speed. So this is the maximum speed of the aircraft. Okay. So if the pilot sets, they adjust the throttle setting. Let's say the the pilot brings the throttle setting to somewhere here, and let's say this is 80 uh, percent. Then eight, at 80 percent, the the available thrust will be reduced. Okay. So this is. 80% TA max, and then aircraft will naturally slow down. And let's assume that the altitude doesn't change, okay? So aircraft slows down, but the, the pilot controls the aircraft such that it maintains the altitude. In that case, it will slow down to this speed. So at 80% throttle setting, the aircraft will be flying at this speed. Okay, so let me now come to this example that I want to show today. Okay, so I just made up this example last night. Okay, so this is not really for a real aircraft. I just made up these numbers for um, easy calculation. Uh, but they are pretty realistic, okay? So it's not, the numbers are not totally off. They are, I chose the numbers to be as realistic as possible. Okay, so suppose that we have an aircraft and we would like to calculate the performance of this aircraft. 
So what we do is we create a small scale version and put it in a wind tunnel and obtain lift and drag coefficient measurements in the wind tunnel and this is the data we get. Okay, so we measure these quantities at uh, 13 different angle of attack values and the, the resulting lift and drag coefficients are measured as you see on the table. Uh, so we can plot these, right? So if you plot the lift coefficient as a function of angle of attack, this is what you get. So here is the stall uh, uh, for this aircraft. It appears that the aircraft stalls at 10 degrees. So this is a really low stalling angle. Uh, but anyway, so if you plot lift coefficient and drag coefficient together, you obtain the drag polar curve. And the drag polar curve is, uh, appears to be this one. Okay? So these are the uh, non-dimensional lift and drag coefficients you obtained in a wind tunnel. Now you have the real aircraft which has uh, these properties. The, angles, uh, the wing surface area is 30 square meters and the weight is 6,000 newtons. And uh, we are con considering a steady level flight for this aircraft which takes place at the altitude where the air density is 1 kilograms per cubic meters. Uh, so now the question is, let's obtain the thrust required and power required curves for this aircraft, for this altitude. Um, okay, so what we normally do is, well, previously I showed you that to obtain thrust required and power required curves, I told you that we use these equations. Uh, so this is the equation for power required and for thrust required you just divide this by velocity okay um, so we can still do that we can use this equation but for this we need to know these uh, values cd0 and k these are the, the parameters of the drag polar equation uh, so if you want to do that what you have to do is you uh, find cd0 and k values for this graph okay and that will uh, put a parabola, um, what well maybe I shouldn't call this parabola because it's uh, um, it's a tilted parabola. But anyways, uh, you can fit a musiapsakya. So let me copy everything to the other software and do it here. Uh, so if you choose that uh, approach, then you will, for example, you can take this directly as your CD0 value. And you find the K value that will give you this parabola, okay? But uh, since this is going to be the curve corresponding to this equation, CD is equal to CD0 plus K times CL squared. And as you see here, it's... Uh, fits the experimental data quite well in a certain range but if you approach here the stalling uh, condition then this equation, uh, this curve doesn't match the real experimental data very well because this uh, doesn't follow uh, this curve anymore uh, so you can still use that, you can find k values and cd0 values that matches the experimental data and use that to draw the charge required and power required curves but that will be an approximation, right? That will, the resulting thrust required and power required curves will be approximate. And that's because, uh, for example, for this drag value, you, this curve predicts this much um, lift coefficient, whereas in reality, the real re lift coefficient will be lower, right? So, 
if you choose to use these parameters and the, the equations for transcribed and power required, uh, your um, calculations will predict a uh, lift coefficient of this much. Whereas in reality, for this drag coefficient value, you have uh, this much lift coefficient, okay? Uh, so in this case, to be more realistic, to obtain the thrust required and power required curves more realistically that matches the experimental data, uh, you can use the data directly without using this curve fitting approach. So what you do here is you basically fit a curve to this data, right? And instead of using curve fitting approach, um, So maybe I should add small notes here to, for you to, uh, to help you while studying this material later on. Um, to plot TR and PR curves, for that we first need to find the CD0 and K values um, by curve fitting. Um, resulting TR and oh yeah, PR curves will be approximate since um, since the fitted direct polar curve doesn't match the real direct polar at at high CD values. For a more realistic, or for more realistic curves, or let me say plot, we can use the experimental data directly without um, using the idealized direct polar curve. Um, and here's how we do it. Well, how we do it is already uh, given here. Tabi şeyler falan gelmedi değil mi denklemler? Okay, so let me do it again and uh, copy this as a picture. Okay, so we are looking for thrust required and power required curves, right? So, for the thrust required plot, the horizontal axis will be speed, and the vertical axis will be thrust required, which is equal to the drag force. And for the other one, the horizontal axis is again the speed of the aircraft, but the vertical axis will be power required. Uh, so, I should calculate thrust required and power required for different speed values, right? So, if I can calculate it for this speed, for this speed, and then I can combine all these data to obtain uh, the curve. Um, uh, 
Okay, so we know that the lift coefficient changes in this range, okay? So it can take a maximum value of 1, and the minimum value it can take is 0. Uh, so, well, it can go even to even negative values, but uh, it doesn't really make sense for our state level flight. So for a state level flight, lift coefficient should always be a positive number. Uh, so we will be making the curves in this range. Uh, so let's start with this, uh, the maximum lift coefficient value. The maximum lift coefficient is 1. So this gives uh, the minimum possible speed for this aircraft, right? It gives the, the stall speed. Uh, so we start with this equation. And we say that the minimum speed value will be obtained for the largest lift coefficient value. So from here, if you solve for the speed, and instead of C out, if you put the maximum value of 1, uh, it turns out that the minimum speed of the aircraft is 20 meters per second. Okay, so that means our curve will be starting from 20 meters per second. So let's say this is the 20 meters per second uh, point. So our curve will be starting here. Use for this meter per second. Now, next I need to find the drag and the power required values. Uh, for that, I need to use the uh, drag equation. This is the drag equation. And I need to find uh, the CD value. Okay? Uh, normally, uh, if we were to use the idealized drag polar equation, uh, we would find put this CL value into the... Um, So let me copy them over here and then talk about that. Okay, so uh, if we were using the idealized direct polar equation, um, then instead of CD, we would be putting CD is equal to K, I'm sorry, uh, CD zero plus K times CL max. Uh, but we're not doing that, right? We're using the data directly. So what we do is, instead of doing that, uh, we are talking about this speed and at that speed the lift coefficient is uh, at its maximum value which is 1 so what we do is we go to the data and we pick the corresponding drag coefficient value from the data okay so for the maximum CL value we find that the drag coefficient value is 0 0.9 okay so the value here is 0 0.9 uh, so we use uh, the 0 0.9 value I'm sorry, 0 0.09, right? It's not 0 0.9, so let me just correct it. It's 0 0.09. Okay, so we use uh, this value that we took directly from the plot uh, for CD. And we find the drag value as 540 newtons. And for power required, we need to... Uh, multiply this value with uh, the speed, right? It's for 540 times the speed, which was 20 meters per second, and that gives us this much value. So we uh, take these values and put them here, okay? So this becomes a point here, and it becomes a point here, okay? So this is just one point, and we have a bunch of other points uh, obtained experimentally. For each of these data points, we can find a corresponding point on the thrust required and power required curves. Uh, well, this is explained in this document.
Okay, so I explained that already, but let me just quickly. Um, okay, so th this point gave us one point on the trust required and power required curves. So to use this point, we check uh, the value of the root coefficient. So it's easier to see that here. So the first point was uh, calculated using this data set. For the second point, we used this lift coefficient and that drag coefficient. First, we need to find the, the speed of the aircraft corresponding to that data point. Uh, the speed of... Okay, so for the second point... We use the data at alpha is equal to 9 degrees. Um, uh, so the the speed of the aircraft for that lift coefficient values found here. Okay, so the next data point is here at 20.5. It's very close to the, the previous one. Uh, and then using the... drag coefficient corresponding to that data point, we calculate TR and PR. And the drag coefficient value for that uh, 9 degrees is this much. So by using <coughs> this drag coefficient and uh, using the uh, trust required or drag equation, we find this much um, drag force or trust required for that second data point. And you should uh, make sure that you use the correct speed value, okay? So in the previous point, the flight speed was 20 meters per second, but for the second data point, it's 20.5. Uh, so for trust required, we obtain this number, and for power required, we obtain this number. Uh, so we come back here and then put these uh, numbers next to the other one. Okay, and we do repeat this uh, the same procedure for every data point. So each for each one of these numbers, uh, you we repeat the same thing, and in the end, we find. Uh, the trust required and power required curves as these or okay um do you have any questions? Okay, so this is uh, how we obtain this trust required and power required curves. And now, once we have this data, we can um, produce many different questions from here. For example, next I ask you to calculate... Okay, so I uh, say that... Uh, suppose that this aircraft is driven by a propeller and the engine can produce a maximum of 60 kilowatts at full throttle and uh, if the pilot sets the throttle to 50 percent what will be the speed of the aircraft so at 60 at full throttle the aircraft can produce 60 kilowatts and at 50 percent throttle the power output of the engine will be just half of that uh, so the available power will be 30,000 watts or 30 kilowatts. Uh, so if you look at here, so this is the power required curve. At 50% throttle, um, the available power is here 30 um, kilowatts. And remember, since this is a propeller, uh, it doesn't change with speed. Okay, so the power is the same at every speed value. And you can intersect this with the power required curve and the intersection point is the 
uh, the steady level flight speed for this aircraft for this altitude at this much uh, throttle setting. And that number happens to be uh, 42.9 meter per second. Okay? And if you want to find the maximum speed of the aircraft for that altitude, then you need to use the maximum power from the engine. And the maximum power was 60 kilowatts. And the 60 kilowatts um, is here. Um, and if you look at where that number intersects the power required curve, it intersects at this point, 55.3 meter per second. Okay? So now we conclude that uh, this aircraft flying at the altitude where the air density is 1 kilogram per meter cube, the maximum uh, speed this aircraft can reach is this much, 55.3 meter per second. Okay? Good. Is this clear? Uh, now the, we can find for what else can we ask here? So we can also ask, for example, what is the minimum throttle setting at which the aircraft can stay in the air? So we know that if the throttle is set to maximum for a steady level flight at this altitude, the speed will be this much. But if you reduce the throttle to 50%, the aircraft will be flying slower at this speed. Uh, but still, you can uh, make the throttle smaller because you still have uh, these points. So to answer that question, to see how, um, what is the minimum throttle setting, we need to find the minimum power required point, right? So if I set to, for example, power to, I need to go to this curve. So it turns out that this is the minimum power required point, which is To find the minimum throttle setting at which the aircraft can maintain a steady level flight, uh, we find the minimum PR value which is uh, 9750 watts and this corresponds to percent of the maximum power. Okay, so the pilot can reduce the power output of the engine down to 16.25 percent and it can still uh, maintain a steady level flight, <clears throat> but at that point it will be flying at uh, this point. So this is PA at as will be flying at this speed. Okay. 
Um, do you have any questions? Okay, so next, um, I would like to show you how all of these uh, change with altitude. Uh, if you go back and look at the equations we used uh, to calculate all of these things, we, the air density row was always in the equations. Okay, so for example, uh, to find this speed value, we need the row value, and we used row is equal to one. But obviously, if row was something else, then this would be a different number, right? Uh, because row is uh, in that equation, or if you use the idealized drag and uh, drag polar equation, then uh, in this equation you would be using these equations, and in these equations again you use uh, the air density. So obviously, <coughs> as the air density changes, all of these things will be changing. And now let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at how these things change with air density. So that's our next topic, and in fact, this is going to be the last topic uh, before the second midterm. Okay, <coughs> so we go back to the idealized drag polar equation, and we bring this equation again. The, this is the equation for the drag force. Uh, so I highlighted the row values. So in this equation, we have row appearing in both of these two. Um, uh, components of the drag force, the parasite drag force and the induced drag force. Uh, so let's say that we obtained a plot. Suppose that we have a thrust required curve obtained at a certain altitude or obtained at a certain air density value. So I should um, so this one is um, TR zero, this one is TRI, right? Uh, so these are obtained at let's say row one. TR0 at row 1 and TRI at row 1. Let's consider let me use a different color, row 2. And let this be a higher altitude. Okay? A higher altitude means that an altitude where air density is uh, less, air density is smaller. So this row 2 is going to be less than row 1. Okay, now the aircraft climbs to a, a higher altitude. Um, so if you go back to these equations, if rho is a smaller value, then uh, TR0 will be smaller, right? Because you'll be multiplying, you, you'll be using a smaller value for rho. So that means for the second altitude, it's going to be something like this. Let me make it red. And since it's, we will be multiplying with a smaller row value, it's going to be uh, scaled like this, right? Takip ediyor musunuz arkadaşlar? Baya bir şey gibi görünüyorsunuz da yorulmuş, sıkılmış. Okay, so this is how the the parasite drag coefficient uh, drag force changes at the, uh, at this high altitude. If you look at the the other one, the induced drag uh, component, this will be more, right? Because the rho is now on the denominator. So if you make rho a smaller number, then this part will be getting larger. Okay? So then this one will be increased. It will be something like this. So let me just make a little bit more space here so that it will be 
uh, easier to see the difference will be bigger. Okay, so the, these red curves are correspond to the higher altitudes. Uh, <coughs> so we need to find the sum of these two for the the total thrust required. So let me uh, plot them as well. Uh, so the for the lower altitude for row one, the minimum will be uh, point will be here, right? But for the um, the second altitude, the minimum point will be here. So obviously, by just without making any um, proper calculations, by just looking at how where the row of, uh, parameter appears in this equation, we can see that. Uh, the thrust required curve will be different at a higher altitude. Okay, so obviously um, the intersection point shifts to the right. That means at the row one altitude, the minimum thrust required speed is this much. But when you climb to a higher altitude where the air density is less, then the minimum thrust required value will be obtained at a, a higher speed. Okay, uh, so our time is up. Let me stop here. Now, on Tuesday, I'll be continuing from here, okay? I will be talking more about uh, how uh, the, the required trust and required power values change with altitude. Uh, because obviously this will become very important, right? Uh, if you are previously on the, on this previous example, we assume that the ACAT altitude was fixed, it didn't change. Uh, but it's a very restricting uh, assumption, obviously. So your the aircraft, most aircraft, they fly at different altitudes. So for different altitudes, you need to be using the correct thrust required and power required curves, and that's what we are looking at. Okay. So if you don't have any questions, let me stop here. I will see you on Tuesday, and before that, before the weekend, I should post. Uh, last year's exam questions. If I don't, please send me an email to remind that, okay? Uh, otherwise, I can just forget that. Uh, but I don't want you to uh, spend the weekend without having those questions. Okay, so I will see you next Tuesday.